Namima, which we translate as tail carrying. But as the scholars define, it is to convey the speech of one person to another with the intention of creating dissension or discord or separation between them. So me listening to one person say something about someone else and then going back to that other person and saying, guess what such and such said about you. That is what is known in Islam as namima, tail carrying. And the object of that in most instance, instances is to create dissension or discord between two people. And you'll find that the person that does this is the worst type of individual. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لا يدخل الجنة قتات يعني نمام That the person who practices namima will not enter into paradise. لا يدخل الجنة قتات And قتات is another word for namam, which is a person who practices namima. قد يروى أن سليمان سليمان ابن عبد الملك قال لي رجل بلغني أنك وقعت فيه وقلت كذا وكذا فقال الرجل ما فعلت فقال سليمان إن, لي أخ إن الذي أخبرني بذلك صادق فقال الرجل لا يكون النمام صادقا فقال سليمان صدقت اذهب بسلام It was narrated that Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik he went to an individual and he said to him, it reached me that you said such and such and such and such about me. I want us to put this in perspective because this is what we do oftentimes. And most of the time, we don't even give the person the benefit of the doubt. We don't even say, did you say this about me? We say, you said this about me because such and such told me. Exactly what he said. He said, بَلَغَنِي أَنَّكَ كُلْتَ فِيَّ كَذَا وَكَذَا he said, it reached me that you said this and this about me. So the man, he said to Suleiman, he said, Ma kultu. I didn't say that about you. Suleiman said, you did say it about me because the person who told me you said it, Sadiq on Indi, he's truthful. I, can, I consider him to be trustworthy and truthful. And the man said to Suleiman, there's no way that a person who practices namima can be truthful and trustworthy. Suleiman said, Ithab bisalam. He said, you're absolutely right. Go ahead. With peace. I, I don't have any issue with you. And think about it. We'll say, the person who told me is trustworthy and honest and truthful. I consider him trustworthy. How can he be trustworthy when he practices namima? How can he be honest? and trustworthy when he is committing a grave sin so much so that the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who practices this sin will not enter into paradise but yet and still you consider him to be trustworthy and honest MashaAllah Tabarakallah how can he be trustworthy and honest and he's practicing a major sin Namima is a major sin in Islam major sin yet and still you consider the person to be trustworthy and honest قال يحيى ابن أبي كثير يفسد النمام في الساعة ما لا يفسد الساحر في الشهر. He said, Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, one of the scholars of the past, he said it is possible that a person who practices namima can cause more destruction in a short span of time than a magician can cause in a whole month. Think about it. All you have to do is go from one person to the next and say, guess what such and such said about you, or such and such said this about you. You can create more destruction with one act of that than a person who practices magic on people can cause in a month. You can destroy a nation, as almost happened here, even in America, with the WikiLeaks and some information, private inf information was leaked about conversations that went on between one country about another country and this and that. And when that information is leaked to other countries, people begin to now d don't have any trust in America, don't have any trust in the government here. And it can create so much discord and dissension between nations. 
And this is the same thing that goes on in the Islamic community between imams. In most Islamic communities, the imams don't have problems with one another. It is, it is the people who follow behind the imams, the people who believe that they have to show their loyalty to the imams that create more problems for the communities. This group of people who has to be loyal to the imam, so they go and they listen to a khutbah from another imam, and then they come back and say, oh, he was talking about you in the khutbah. Subhanallah al And he may not have even been thinking about that imam. But yet and still, you came, you listened to the khutbah, and you assumed on an assumption that he was referring to your imam, and you went back and you told him this is what he was talking about. And so this imam now does a khutbah, preparing a khutbah against another imam. And this goes on in so many communities, subhanAllah. So many communities. And it's not the imams themselves, but it is actually the people who feel that they have to show their loyalty and their allegiance to those imams. So this is number, number nine from the afat al lisan and from the dangers of the tongue, and that is practicing namima. And if in fact we want to convey information to someone, do it in a manner where you want to create islah, where you want to create rectification between two feuding parties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Qur'an, وَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ And make rectification, reconciliation between your two contending brothers. And fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But don't do it for the purpose of creating a bigger gap between the ummah. The last thing we need is two more leaders of Islam feuding with one another. When you turn the pages of the history of Islam, all you see is feuding and feuding one leader to another. One leader to another. When will it stop? As uh, Uthman anhu, he used to have a habit of, even when he traveled, he would not shorten his prayer. He would still pray for raka'ah. So when they were on Mina, in, on Hajj, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud anhu, he performed Salatul Dhuhr, shortened and combined. Shortened and combined. So when they said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Uthman, he prayed for raka'ah and he doesn't combine. I thought you said that this was the, the sunnah to shorten and combine. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, yes, it is the sunnah. They said, well, why don't you say something to Uthman? He said, Uthman is the khalifa. Well, ikhtilaf sharr and differing with the leaders is evil. It has nothing, no good can come out of that. And there's no sin on him if he decides not to shorten his prayer. But I'm not going to go with him, go to him and debate with him about an issue and create any dissension or discord between myself and the Khalifa. And there's so many other issues. As Ishaq ibn Rahuya, one of the contemporaries of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, used to differ with Imam Ahmed so much. Imam Ahmed said about him, Ishaq akhuna he said, Ishaq is still my brother even though he differs with me in many things. Even though the scholars tried to avoid differing as much as possible, even the differing that they did have, it wasn't to the point where it would create dissension and discord between the harmony and the ukhuwa and the brotherhood of Islam. Whereas today, we use it as a tool to not like one another based upon a premise that we already had about one another. I don't like you, so I use my... Dis differing with you as a means or as a reason to justify me separating myself from you. And the last afatul lisan, the last of the dangers of the tongue, is al madh is praising people. Wa ma akthara al yawm. And how much do we see this today? Flattery, flattery, praising people in their face and flattering people and making people feel good. We call it siyasa. We call it politics. But in fact, it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests. وَلَهُ آفَاتْ مِنْهَا مَا يَتَعَلَّقْ بِالْمَادِحِ وَمِنْهَا مَا يَتَعَلَّقْ بِالْمَمْدُوحِ There's two people that are involved in flattery. There's the madih, the one who flatters, and the mamduh is the one who is being flattered. The danger that is in this affects both people, the one that is doing it and the one that it is being done to. He said, أَمَّا آفَاتِ الْمَادِحِ فَقَدْ يَكُورُ مَا لَا يَتَحَقَّقُهُ وَلَا سَبِيلُ وَلَا سَبِيلَ لِإِتِّلَاعَ عَلَيْهِ مِثْرُ أَنْ يَكُولَ إِنَّهُ وَرِعٌ أَوْ زَاهِدٌ وَقَدْ يُفَرِّدْ فِي الْمَدْحِ 
وينتهي إلى الكذب وقد يمدح من لا ينبغي أن يمدح. He said that perhaps the person that is flattering, the person that is doing the flattering, perhaps he could praise someone for something that is not realistic and praise someone for something that he himself has no knowledge of. We say, oh, such and such is pious. How do you know he's pious? How do you know someone is pious? You're only judging a person based upon what you see. Piety is something that is from the affairs of the unseen, of matters of the heart. We say, oh, mashallah, I consider the brother to be pious and righteous and subhanallah al-azim. Ittaqillah fi nafsi. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not to go so deep in your praise of an individual. To say someone is a zahid. Oh, say brother is an ascetic. He's an ascetic brother. He stays away from the dunya. How do you know? That is a matter of the heart. Because a person doesn't buy into the dunya, doesn't make him a zahid. Zuhud, asceticism is a matter of the heart, not a matter of materialistic things. So perhaps the person that is praising someone could do so in a manner where you're praising him for things that you yourself have absolutely no knowledge of. He said, and perhaps you can go to the extreme in your praising of someone to the point where it becomes kadib, where it becomes an absolute lie. You get up and you say, oh, this brother is such and such and I consider him to be, and it's an absolute lie. It's an absolute lie. He said, and perhaps the worst thing that a person can do in flattering someone or praising someone, and yamdah is to praise someone who deserves to be condemned and criticized. That's even worse. You get up and you praise someone and the person is worthy of condemnation and criticism, but you praise him. And you'll find this in politics a lot as well. وَقَدْ رُوِيَ فِي حَدِيثٍ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْضَبْ إِذَا مُضِحَ الْفَاسِقِ It was mentioned in the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets upset or gets angry when a person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests it, he hates it, for you to get up and praise someone who deserves to be criticized and deserves to be condemned. وَلِهَذَا قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَأَمَّا الْمَمْدُوحِ فَإِنَّهُ يُحْدِثُ فِيهِ كِبْرًا وَإِعْجَابٍ وَهُوَ مُهْلَكَانِ He said, as for the memduh, the one that is being praised, the one that is being flattered, the danger with that is that you can create in him kibr, arrogance, وَإِعْجَابٍ and pride and, you know, looking at himself, you know, in a manner where he begins to magnify his qualities and magnify himself. And as a result of this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَمَّا سَمِعَ رَجُلًا يَمْدَحْ رَجُلًا قَالَ وَيْلُ لَكْ قَطَعْتَ أُنَكَ صَاحِبِكْ Now when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard a man praising another man in his presence, he said, woe be to you, you have broken his neck. You have cut his throat. Meaning you have killed him. Because when you praise a person in his face like that, the person begins to see himself more than what he is to the point where he begins to destroy himself. He becomes someone who magnifies his own qualities because of people constantly praising him. And if we praise someone, the Prophet wasallam instructed us that we should say, Ahsabuhu kada wallahu hasibuhu. That I consider him to be such and such, and Allah knows him better. I consider him to be such and such, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows him better. And I'll stop here bi idhnillahi ta'ala wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira wa akhiru da'wana. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.